the excitement mounts, the huge files full of information are getting heavier and heavier. I keep having to take my, my satchel and do all the school homework. My brain is getting fuller and fuller. I don't know about yours, Vanessa. Have you got any more room in yours for more facts and figures about the coronation? Gosh, there isn't one medieval robe I don't feel I've snitched by hand. <laughs> it's all it's all overwhelming us, really, already, and we're not even up to it. But, but Princess Anne, they're in tremendously good spirits, Sarah. Yes, look, uh, these big sit-down TV interviews don't always work out too well for members of the royal family, uh, do they? But this one bucks the trend. She is refreshingly candid, uh, very frank, uh, talking there in that clip we just played about whether or not uh, the royal family should be slimmed down and perhaps that might have seemed a good idea when there were a few more of them around. Of yes. course, we've had the departure of Harry and Meghan, we've had uh, the exit stage left of Prince Andrew and we've lost uh, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. So she's effectively saying, well, look, there's only so much the rest of us uh, can do, and perhaps the King doesn't need to do that right and, now. And well-known as the hardest-working royal of the lot, isn't she, Rupert? Uh, she is, and, and very pragmatic. Mm. Um, and that's what seemed to come through. She is a pragmatic person, and she dealt with all the questions coming to her. And that was, you know, her making that reference. She understands that, what if, how can we be slimmed down? <laughs> because there aren't many more of us left. And, and, and she knows we, the royal family, have to get out there and do their job. And if, if they slim it down even more, then how will they be able to do their, do their job and be able to go to all parts, not only of this country, but the Commonwealth? So it is... I think, a, a realistic approach. Approach. I think mm. one of the problems is maybe the slimming down might be how you deal with all the palaces and everything else that needs and the financial, but actually the individuals going out there and doing their job, mm -hmm. well, there aren't many more to pair so down. So do we I think, Sarah, think. we're talking about uh, the Wessexes, Edward and Sophie, or, or now he's called Duke of Edinburgh, isn't it, that they're, that they're going to, to, to step up and really... I mean, they already have. We've yes. seen them taking on increasingly prominent roles. Of course, they now have uh, more senior titles. But they've always been there doing the job. It's just that they're getting noticed for it a bit now, mm -hmm. I suppose. And um, when you talk about strong females in the royal family, we've just seen one there, uh, Princess Anne and the Duchess of Edinburgh, uh, Sophie Wessex, again, as she was uh, formerly. Sophie, we Sophie, again, a real force and a real asset uh, to the king. All right, let's look at Princess Anne now, talking about what kind of a king her brother Charles is going to be. We've been very lucky. Um, my mother, was the Queen for a very long time. And although you kind of know that this might happen, you don't really think about it very much. Not least of all, because the monarchy is about continuity. But I think for my brother, you know, this is something he's been waiting for. And he's probably spent more time thinking about it. Um, for the rest of us, it's more a question of, OK, we have to shift the way we support. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a, a pretty sort of self-effacing and kind of compassionate way of describing it, so I would have thought. Yes, and asked, you know, what's he going to be like as king? She says, well, you know what you're getting. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's quite interesting. She draws a line between the monarchy and the royal family as the support act, and she very much puts herself in there in the role to, to follow, to do what she's asked to do and to support the institution of the monarchy and, and when she's asked about the relevance of the monarchy uh, later on in the interview she said well you know that's certainly a question that will be asked this is the time to ask it but it's not me who's got to answer that yes. question. I, I'm struck Rupert I don't know whether you are by the the difference between Princess Anne and her approach to being the sister of the now monarch and Princess Margaret the Queen's sister who always seemed to be at a loose end and you know kicking about the place with nothing much to do except to sing duets with Peter Sellers and drink a lot of whiskey and look as if she wasn't really somebody with an actual job. Princess Anne has turned it into not just a full-time job but about five full-time jobs hasn't well, she? She's always got a no-nonsense approach to life. Mm -hmm. She always has has, and this was what has been relevant. And I actually think it's she and the Queen will be hugely positive influences around the King. They're both very sort of pragmatic people. Um, they know exactly what they want. They will be a good sounding board from both sides, obviously. His sister, she is, a, as I say, no nonsense. And I think it's a really good fit for him because clearly he can sort of go off at a bit of a tangent and, and maybe his temper can get the better of him or just get frustrated. But with both Camilla and the Princess Royal around him, he has very strong influences. And again, that influence you talk about the Duchess of Edinburgh, mm. there is some very powerful support for him within the framework to help him 
in his transition now I mean, to being our said, king. Sarah, the princess of royal, Princess Anne, certainly had a temper of her own in the old days. You could well, see her I, core, you could see her kicking off there. with members of Her Majesty's press and photographers. I've interviewed and, her before. Yeah, she's, and, you know, and she's a bristler, uh, isn't you she? You definitely have got to be bring your A-game yeah. because, you know, she doesn't suffer fools. She is just like her late father, yeah. uh, Prince Philip. And, uh, you know, absolutely no nonsense, doesn't want to fuss, wants to get on with it uh, and get on with it quickly. Uh, and that is the approach she takes. So, for example, if she's going to take a, uh, a visit overseas, uh, she won't be taking a big entourage. She'll be packing her own bag, <laughs> carrying her own bag, and she'll just be getting on with it. And she wants to see others get on with it. I don't think she's perhaps got the patience for... Uh, indecision. And I wonder whether that pragmatic approach, Rupert, has to some extent destroyed the kind of romance of princessdom that people who see her want to see. They've waited their whole lives to see her. They want a bit of a bit of pomp and circumstance. They want a sort of panoply. They want a beautiful gown that flows with lace and ribbons. They don't really want her to be, you know, striding in with her own suitcase saying, OK, let's get the job down. OK, I've planted the tree. Goodbye and getting on the bus and going home <laughs> because it's not what they're it's not what they're there to see, is she it? She is not a Hollywood princess. No, she's she not. Is, she is not going to but, play that game. But um, that is you might. Some people might have felt that is her role, though. And no. certainly everybody remembers those amazing um, photographs of her, well, I certainly do, before her wedding. And weren't they taken by Cecil Bean or, or Norman Parkinson? And she suddenly, for those those moments in those photographs, looked like a fairy tale princess. It was a kind of one off, really. Yeah, but, but at she that did. time, she was actually a European champion, three day eventer. She was basically happier mucking out horses <laughs> than putting on a wedding dress. Yeah. So, and, and when she married Captain Mark Phillips, they spent their time three-day eventing. Um, she'd probably be happier to be at Babington this weekend rather than trotting around at the coronation, but yeah. uh, maybe that's a step Well, I far. thought one of the most telling remarks, actually, in the interview was when she was asked about her role during the coronation. She's going to be gold stick in waiting, mm -hmm. so she will be on horse behind the gold state coach as it heads back to Buckingham Palace from Westminster Abbey. And she said, well, at least that sorts my outfit out. <laughs> and, and is it the same, very similar to the outfit we saw her wearing when the Queen died? Yes. In the, the trousers uniform. and the military yes. uniform. OK, yes. now, th this is Prince Princess Anne, uh, we haven't gone. Okay, so she 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 did go on to speak in this interview about uh, her parents mm -hmm. and COVID and the effect of COVID, particularly on her father, Prince Philip. Yes, she um, was asked by the interviewer whether she agreed with uh, the sentiment that COVID had stolen from all of us. And she said yes, particularly when it came to her father, because he died during COVID. And she said that in his last uh, months, he was denied those human contacts, the conversations that would have kept him interested and kept him going. And she felt saddened uh, by that. And she was also asked about the funeral and the image of her mother sitting yeah. there in St George's Chapel on the Windsor Estate with uh, nobody around her. And she said, actually, Fortunately, we couldn't really see that ourselves. Oh. You saw that vantage point much more than we did, and I'm glad we didn't see it at the time. Yes, Rupert. I think what it actually reflects is what so many families went through. Mm. Theirs was obviously in the full glare of publicity, and that funeral desperately sad. Only 30 people there in St George's Chapel and that lonely picture of her just sitting there, head bowed, looking frail mm. and, and sort of remembering her late husband. It, it was very poignant, but it was actually... A, 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 a picture that many families went through and what the Princess Royal is referring to there is just like a lot of other people would have had old parents who missed that human contact and that keeping the brain going and that Prince Philip's brain was one of the most active going and he, he must have been desperately frustrated by, by the Covid experience. I think we should just mention at this point how awfully game Princess Anne, the Princess Royal is. I mean, she could be on horseback, it could be absolutely pelting it down. Let's hope it's not, we pray it's not, but it might be as the Queen's own coronation and the late Queen's coronation was an absolute deluge of a day, wasn't it? And there she is, what, I don't know how old she is, a roundabout, it's ungallant to say, so what, about 70? 72. 72. Oh, but she can still ride pretty well. I don't think we need to worry about but, uh, but I don't know how many so 72 year olds would happily leap atop a horse and go along, you know, in poor, poor, arguably pouring rain and God knows what. It's quite a That's her big, everyday life. Uh, big though, deal, isn't it? it? Yeah. Uh, and and she wear, it's not very comfortable what she's wearing. Great big boots yeah. and then the military uniform uh, to reflect her status. But she's a privileged position to be that gold stick mm -hmm. uh, leading behind the procession. So it's a, a very... and reflects the importance, I think, more in, uh, to mm. um, the king 
the role that Anne will play in the, in the coming years. And they were famously rivals when they were children, weren't they? And used to bicker endlessly. So this is a tremendous denouement of real happiness, harmony and assisting one another. And it's quite clear, really loving and respecting one another. It's incredibly nice to see. Thank you both so much for coming in.